There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. In the last video, we talked about the use of atomic absorption spectroscopy in detecting concentrations of metal ions. So, for example, that we could use atomic absorption spectroscopy to find out how much is inside a sample, but not only how much, but very small amount. So, for example, in parts per million, as opposed to grams or milligrams. So gravimetric analysis, which is also a way that we can find out how much is inside a sample, that only allows us to figure out milligrams or grams, whereas we can use this AAS to figure out how much is inside on a very, very tiny level, such as parts per million. So just imagine parts per million, that's a very, very tiny measurement. But we have to talk about not this in this video, but something else, which is the second part. It says assess its impact on scientific understanding of the effect of trace elements. Right, so we have to talk about how we could use AAS to figure out what effect these different types of trace minerals have. So for example, zinc, copper, iron, and iodine, these are examples of trace minerals, which are often in different parts of the earth, and soil, etc., etc., but only a very small amount. So I've just kind of put it into two or three different categories. The first part is it allowed us to detect levels of trace minerals in soil, for example, and in animals or plants. So let's say we have two farmers. Farmer one here, so this is farmer one, and we have farmer two on the other side. Now they're both planting corn, right? I mean, this is meant to be corn. It doesn't really look like corn, but that's just because of my drawing skills aren't really that well, aren't really that good. But let's say this is corn. They're both growing their corn, and one person has absolutely no problem at all when it comes to their corn. It grows perfectly fine. The other farmer, farmer two, has a problem. His corn doesn't grow properly. Now the question would be, why is that happening? So before we did have this technology, before we had AAS, we couldn't really figure out exactly what's inside the soil because there's often so such small amounts that we could, didn't have any technique to be able to analyze those small levels. But once we had AAS developed, what that meant is we could take a sample, let's say we take a sample of the soil and figure out how many of different types of, let's say zinc, copper, iron, Etc. Etc. are inside this actual sample. So they might say, okay, here we have, let's say, 50 parts per million. This is just a random number I made up. 50 parts per million of zinc per sample. Whereas the same size sample in the other one, here we might only have two parts per million of zinc in the deficient soil. And so now we figured out, okay, this deficient soil seems to be lacking zinc compared to the non-deficient soil. So maybe the zinc has some kind of purpose that the plants need, right? so it serves some role that the plants need, that, and that's the reason why these plants aren't growing, because they have no zinc and thereby they can't grow. Before AAS, we didn't have this technology which allowed us to figure this out, but with AAS, we had the technology and we could figure out different levels of trace minerals in soil and in, in tissue of plants and animals, and that allowed us to figure out what these different types of minerals are actually used for as well. That was the second part. So the role of trace minerals in plants and animals. And these are the four I just mentioned, zinc, iron, copper, and iodine. Now we didn't only, I mean, they're just, they aren't just in soil, but they also have a reason why we need them, right? So for example, zinc is needed for energy production. So that makes sense. So if this, for example, doesn't have, if these plants, which also need to produce energy for ATP, if these plants don't have enough zinc, that means they can't produce enough energy, which means they wouldn't be able to grow properly. Right? So that's why Zinc deficiency causes them to not grow properly. Makes sense. Now, there are other examples as well. So, for example, this is something that quite a few biology students should be familiar with. This here is meant to be a red blood cell. And within red blood cells, we have these yellow dots, which in this case are meant to be hemoglobin. So, more or less, red blood cell just carries lots of hemoglobin. And remember, red blood cells are inside our blood, right? So, they are inside our blood and they carry oxygen. So, we've got red blood cells. Inside these red blood cells are these hemoglobin. And hemoglobin are made up of a globin part. That's, globin is just a protein. And also these heme groups. Heme is just a different word for iron. And these iron groups are what we're interested in. Because what happens at these iron groups is that's where oxygen attaches. Right? So oxygen it's, itself is within these hemoglobin, but more specifically attaches to these iron groups. So these red blood cells carry lots of oxygen, but they can only carry oxygen if they have these hemoglobins within them. And more specifically, if they have these ion groups within the hemoglobin. 
So what that means is if we have a lack of iron, so if we, have, if we are iron deficient, if a human being is iron deficient, what that means is they will have less of these hemoglobins, and what that means is they can carry less oxygen. And we need oxygen to produce energy. So if people who are lacking iron in their diet, for example, they would be iron deficient, which means they would be fatigued quite easily. They would often run out of energy. Right? And we only really found out exactly what iron does in our body. Once we could actually analyze a sample, let's say we took a blood sample and figured out, okay, someone who seems to always get tired for whatever reason has maybe, so the person who's fatigued, he might have, let's say, again, a random number, 500 parts per million of iron, whereas a person who has absolutely no problem with fatigue, he is you know, always running and always energetic, he might have, let's say, 10,000 parts per million. Again, don't take this number serious, just to show you it's bigger. Right? So now we figured, okay, well, energy, something, energy with, with oxygen, iron has something to do with this. And we figured that out using the techniques developed through the atomic absorption spectroscopy. Now we figured out the roles of trace minerals in plants and animals, such as zinc being needed for energy production. We also found out that iron was required for the production of hemoglobin. We found out that copper was needed for enzyme production. Enzymes are something that makes our chemical reactions inside our body happen. And we found out that iodine was, for example, required for the proper growth of the thyroid gland, which is at your throat. So at your throat. So if you don't have enough iodine, that means you're going to have goita, which is an unpleasant condition. Right, so this development, this technology, allowed us to figure out what these trace minerals were actually required for, such as zinc being required for energy, iron for production of hemoglobin, etc., etc. And the last one is also it allowed us to see what kind of effects heavy metal pollutants have. So first of all, it allows us to see what actually causes heavy metal poisoning. So, for example, that we have lead, mercury, chromium to a degree as well. So all of these are actually causing problems. Beforehand, we couldn't figure that out. But afterwards, after we had this technology, we could figure it out. And one reason how we could figure it out was, for example, if we have a fish, right? This fish right now is happy. You can see he's smiling. It's not meant to be smiling, but it just looks like it's smiling. But he's happy. He's not dead. He's, you know, swimming around. But then he's going to always, there might be mercury in this ocean. And this mercury might get into his mouth. So here's the mercury part here. And over time, there'd be more and more mercury inside his stomach. And once it gets to a certain level, that fish will die. Right? So it has died from poisoning. So the fish is dead. Now it's going to be not happy anymore. But you could actually, you could take a sample, right? So you might take a sample of the fish. Let's say you take this chunk of meat as your sample. You put it into the atomic absorption spectroscopy machine. And then you find out there is actually, let's say... 500 parts per million of mercury inside that sample, which means that fish had way too much mercury, and that may, might be the reason why it's dead. Right? So now we figure out, okay, mercury might be a really bad metal to consume on a large basis because it is actually poisonous. And we used this kind of information to figure out that lead, mercury, and chromium, amongst a few of them, are actually quite bad for our health. But not only what causes it, but also the levels, right? So we said that 500 parts per million of mercury might be problematic. But let's say we find out that if we only have one part per million inside our system, so one part per million of mercury, that that would still be okay. And these are now numbers are, are made up. I'm just saying that we managed to figure out what's actually unhealthy, what causes metal, heavy metal poisoning, what pollutants cause problems, but also kind of the safe limits of how much we could theoretically have without having any major problems. So I'll quickly go over sort of what this technology allows us to do. It allows us to detect, it allows us to analyze samples of animals and plants to figure out the role of trace minerals in plants. So for example, it allows us to figure out that zinc was needed for energy production, iron was required for production of hemoglobin, copper was required for the enzyme production, and iodine was required for the proper functioning of the thyroid gland. Right? So it, happened, it allows us to understand the role of these trace minerals in plants and animals, and also allowed us to ha see what kind of effects heavy metal pollutants have. So for example, that you know, when there was lots of poisoning happening in fishes and other, and other animals or plants, they were often due to these heavy metals, which could be found in their tissue. 
such as lead, mercury, and chromium. But we also found out that you know if you have a certain amount, if it's above a certain amount, that's when you get the symptoms. That's when you get the problems. If it's below a certain amount, you might still be safe. So we had this. We also managed to establish a range that would be healthy or unhealthy. But yeah, that's that part of that dot point. But hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.